everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous special guest slash co-hosts. Hello, Rob. It's Dr. Diana Perry Cruz. Good evening. It's Dr. Jacqueline McDonald. And we also have an actual special guest as well. So no, no offense to you guys, but we it's also still have gonna an be May, actual special, special guest. <laughs> Because it can't be it can't be any better than having you guys a special guest. We need one more special guest, and who do we have here? Bill Ahern. Hi, Bill. It's so great to have you back on. It's fun to be here. Always nice to talk to you guys. You're our first repeat guest. Oh, that's yeah. true. Oh. I'm gonna We're be so like happy. on Saturday Night Live when Steve Martin <laughs> comes back on the Five Timers Club. That's yeah, awesome. Right. Just, Thank you for just coming. Just a few years down the road. <laughs> Excellent. So for those of you who are new to the show, ABA Inside Tracks, a podcast where we discuss behavior analysis and behavior analytic research. And every week we have a special topic. But all this month, all of our topics must relate to research published by one of us. Never me, because I haven't published anything. But <laughs> one of the two <laughs> ladies. Remaining one of the two doctors, honey. One of the two doctors on the show. And this but why, Rob? Why? I, I don't know, Diana. Why? It's gonna, gonna be, be May. May. Oh yes, because it's it's gonna be May, and so <laughs> you May. love it. Yeah, it's great. I love it so. <laughs> uh, so this week we are talking about research that Jackie you've published about. Yes. And Diana you've published about. Yeah. And Bill you've published about. Reluctantly. <laughs> And it is behavioral momentum. Yay, behavioral momentum. Yay. This is part of the show where I stop talking about behavioral momentum <laughs> and I let our experts do the talking. Uh, no, so behavioral momentum is a, is a very misunderstood, I think I'm misunderstood by a lot of uh, a lot of behavior analysts. So we're going to have this episode and then next week we're going to have a whole episode on the high P, low P instructional sequence, which, spoiler alert, if you thought that's what we were talking about this episode, you don't understand Behavioral momentum. But never ah. fear you will. Yeah, that, that's, that's the, the optimistic point, way right? to go, So don't Diana. feel bad because there's a lot of misuse being thrown around. Yes. In the next two hours, you will <laughs> uncover the mystery of behavioral momentum. <laughs> Bring, turn the page. So we have a whole bunch of articles that we will be referring to. Some of them you might want to just listen to maybe, you know, Bill or Jackie or Diana talk about rather than maybe... Read yourself. Uh, Mine's easy. Read but it. We'll, but we'll see. So let's let's go over what they are, shall we? None of these are out of anybody's reach. Okay, good. That's the, that's the spirit, Bill. Everyone can read these articles. <laughs> I don't know if I trust you, but <laughs> just don't get caught up in equations. They're not important. Okay, don't get caught. Okay, so good. We'll get we'll get to that. Some I was good I was a little worried we were going to be doing a lot of equation talks tonight. Okay, math. So uh, the first article, or, or one of the articles that we'll sort of be be going over in our. Our large talk about behavioral momentum is the analysis of behavioral momentum. That's by Nevin Mandel and ATAC, and that's in the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior, 1983. We'll be talking about resistance to disruption in a classroom setting by Perry Cruz, Neil Ahern, Wheeler, Primchander, Loeb, and Duby, and that's in Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 2011. That I, I recognized a few of the names in that in that you list. Might have. Some of you listeners might have as well. We'll also be talking about persistence do during extinction, examining the effects of continuous and intermittent reinforcement on problem behavior by McDonald, Ahern, Perry, Cruz, Bancroft, and Doobie. Again, I'm hearing some similar names again. Uh, <laughs> Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2013. And then we'll also be kind of in preparation for next week, but also because it's relevant to this week, The Momentum of Compliance by Nevin in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 1996. And then uh, we'll also be discussing behavioral momentum and the treatment of noncompliance briefly. And then we'll be talking about it more next week. And that's uh, Mace, Hawk, Lally West, Belfiore, Pinter, and Brown in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 1988. And then, Bill, you have an, you have an audible, another one you're going to be discussing as well. Persistence of Stereotypic Behavior, Examining the Effects of External Reinforcers by Ahern, Clark, Gardnier, Chung, and Duby. And that's in Java 2003. So really, you can just have a whole weekend of fun reading about behavior momentum. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. We gave you an article for every day. Yep. You can just <laughs> oh, be like, what day is it? Oh, it's behavior momentum day. It's your Java. Day two, it's, day it's your behavior an analysis advent calendar. It's like, oh, it's, yeah. oh, wow. Oh. It's another one. <laughs> I'm going to make that That's for I, next year. We got we to get an Etsy store up and running. Yeah. Well, All right. Yeah. 
That's that's enough fooling around. Let's get serious with behavioral momentum. Bill, you 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 were so kind to join us again and suggested that we kind of just start back at the beginning and kind of go through behavioral momentum and then kind of talk maybe at the end about where we're going with with research on behavioral momentum. So once you kind of get it rolling, once we get is it that rolling, what you mean you know once you kind of build it. I know I didn't even think about that. You're the pun meister here, so that's. But um, bump. <laughs> not really though. What? Just kidding. <laughs> So let's start just by discussing what is behavioral momentum? What is it really? Well, it's hard to talk about behavioral momentum without rolling back a little bit further than that. Let's go to the very beginning of behavior analysis. Time. <laughs> <laughs> the dinosaurs found behavior. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, phylogeny is certainly important to behavior. <laughs> But uh, Skinner's real contribution was with respect to behavior that occurs during an individual's lifetime. Skinner suggested that when we study behavior, the most primary fundamental datum of behavior when we're studying it freely occurring in nature is rate. So the rate of behavior, behavior in time, is the way that we measure behavior at one point in time versus another point in time. So as Skinner was studying behavior, examining rate, one of the things that he proposed from having observed behavior over a long period of time was that rate was behavior occurring with strength. So the higher the rate of the behavior, putatively, the higher the strength of the response class. That particular notion holds a lot of validity. It is certainly the case that we're not only interested in behavior that is correctly or appropriately measured by rate. But when it comes to how we're going to conceptualize any single operant class of behavior, the concept that that behavior has some strength certainly is in line with the data that we have relative to schedules of reinforcement. Certain schedules of reinforcement create behavior occurring at higher rates as behavior occurs at higher rates, when we introduce disruptors like extinction or change from one schedule of reinforcement to another schedule of reinforcement, the amount of time it takes for behavior to change is thought to be somewhat a measure of the response class's strength. So there's some problems that come up with Skinner's rate is equivalent to the strength of a particular response class. And some of the observations that we have come about when we attempt to take our own perspective and squeeze different kinds of behavior into the box of being the same. So if we attempt to equate a ratio schedule, for instance, with an interval-based schedule, we might say, well, we have this fixed rate schedule of reinforcement, the equivalent rate of occurrence relative to a fixed interval schedule is x however that's never true because an interval based schedule produces one kind of pattern of behavior whereas a ratio based schedule produces a different kind of pattern of behavior we can talk about jackie's study in a little while and sort of develop some more of the thoughts that come with that idea of response strength as being rightly measured by rate but nevin's idea came from studying behavior in multiple schedule arrangements one of the things that he noticed was that when two schedules of reinforcement are in place, each linked to a particular discriminative stimulus, that if we see something happening with respect to a contingency change with one of those scheduled arrangements, right, something might happen in the other one as well, even though that contingency is the same. Sometimes we refer to that as behavioral contrast, and that was a phenomenon that was studied with that particular preparation for a long time. One of the observations that came to Nevin through the multiple schedule work that he was doing was that rate was not the best way of describing what kinds of changes happen when you introduce something such as extinction or change from one schedule of reinforcement to another. That's where the idea of behavioral momentum comes in. And was it because, did he feel like that he couldn't measure it because they were, you know, happening at different rates and you couldn't compare both rates because they were looking at the schedule and then moving it into some disruption? Or was there another way, another way that he categorized it? Well, I think it's probably 
fairly accurate to say that he was tacting those differences mm-hmm. that you're talking about yeah. in the data that were being produced by his lab and, and some others that were working with multiple schedule arrangements. But the observation came about by doing things such as imposing extinction or providing reinforcement that is independent of the particular response. So providing extra access to preferred stimuli in a situation in which mm-hmm. behavior is already ongoing, which may disrupt the rate of responding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that rate disruption effect that occurs was something that if the schedule of reinforcement was denser relative to being leaner, that amount of disruption would be lesser for the denser schedule of reinforcement than for the leaner schedule of reinforcement. So this idea of behavioral momentum really is drawn directly as an analog to physical momentum. So I know you're all physics majors out there. (laughs) I know I am. (laughs) But it's a relatively simple concept, as is behavioral momentum. So as I said before, don't get hung up in equations there there really is a useful idea here that will mean something to you if you're a clinician if you care to learn the lesson but most of what there is behind this idea of physical momentum is that objects in time and space move and when they're moving they tend to continue to move when they're at rest they continue to stay at rest but as an object is moving through time and space. It is the the rate, right, the velocity that that particular object has, as well as the mass that determines the momentum of that particular object. So if I have a basketball and a bowling ball, and they're both traveling in space at the same rate of speed, the bowling ball has more physical momentum because it has greater mass. Nevin suggested from looking at the data that were being generated, that operant classes of behavior, discriminated operant classes of behavior, had what looked like to be momentum properties to them, in that when we saw a rate of occurrence with a particular schedule of reinforcement, the the density of that schedule was an important factor that determined the behavioral momentum, irrespective of the rate. So we could have two response classes occurring at roughly the same rate, And the one that's associated with the denser schedule of reinforcement is going to be more likely to persist or less likely to change in the face of contingency changes. So when he first, you know, discovered this or, you know, linked these two together, was this like revolutionary at that time or was the research moving toward this way anyway? I always wonder that. Well, I have to say during the early 1970s, not that I was yet a behavior analyst myself, (laughs) there certainly were a lot of exciting examinations of behavior in interesting situations. For instance, the matching law was being examined when we were looking at schedules that involved concurrent arrangements with behavior being exposed to these concurrent schedules of reinforcement. Behavior comes in line with the relative reinforcement probability for behavior Right. such that the matching law gives us a good prediction. Momentum was something that was developing during the same time. That, that so would make like, a lot of sense, yeah. What are the equations? Can we try out? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get all the equations. We're math we could, people. We could uh, give some of the origins of delayed discounting, but I suggest you bring Jason Bure on for that particular Okay, discussion. I agree. <laughs> Let's not try to tackle that one on our own. Yeah. <laughs> well, that kind of makes sense. Well, one of the interesting things about the momentum analysis is it's a pretty consistent finding that when we examine a particular response class relative to another similar response class that's maintained by a schedule of reinforcement that varies, we can predict what's going to happen for those two classes of responding based upon the density of reinforcement that occurs for those particular response classes. So we're talking about the momentum metaphor. We're talking about two different schedules of reinforcement. One similar kind of class of behavior. And this, it's generally the early work that Nevin was doing was done with pigeons. And pigeons pecking on various schedules of reinforcement, their behavior comes in line with those contingencies fairly quickly. If Mm -hmm. they're uh, signaled by separate discriminative stimuli, 
But the changes that happen to those responses um, are going to, to differ, even though the contingency change might be the same thing. When we implement extinction, we expect behavior to decrease. Maybe there's a brief increase. If you had a podcast about extinction bursts, we perhaps, have not. You, perhaps yeah. you want to you know, grab somebody to, to talk about that there mm-hmm. are, or just use the stuff that's out there in the literature. Dorothy Lerman, mm-hmm. for instance, did a very interesting analysis of extinction bursts showing that extinction bursts are not inevitable and that there are certain right. situations that are less likely. Lerman and all, 1996, I believe. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> Spent a lot of time with that one. I was very intimate with it. <laughs> with a, rural, a ruler and like drawing lines to the y axis. Oh, you did. Oh, that's yeah, right. Yes. Remember that? You did, yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. a Panera. Yeah. With my old lady friend. Yeah, you, she comes up a lot. She's I like know. a recurring character on the show now. <laughs> She's going to show up someday. She's still alive. <laughs> She's going to sue us for likeness rights. Yeah. Nowadays, you can just scan the graph in and have the software associated with this particular product tell you what the numbers no. are rather what? than just drawing lines. No, what? That's, that's actually too easy. <laughs> that's too easy. And, and it's kind of cheating. Yeah. Especially if you had to do that sort of thing. Right. I agree. <laughs> and again, I drew most of my graphs by hand when I was in graduate school. I like the idea of that. I feel like we had one time where Dan Gould showed us, like, this is how you would do a graph if you needed to do it by hand. You're never going to have to do that again. So, But it was a good lesson. Yeah, I know your roots, Rob. I appreciate it. I appreciated the lesson. It was fun. It was very enjoyable. I love old studies because you can tell that they're (laughs) hand-drawn. Yeah. And mimeographed and all that. It's like, it was a special time. So how did we get, you know, from the early work that Nevin did to your 2003 article? Well, there had been a lot of different preparations with multiple schedules that Mm -hmm. showed the momentum metaphor was something that was a useful way of making predictions about what would happen to behavior in different situations. The early work in the 1970s going into the 1980s really came to a head in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when Nevin was working with Randy Grace, mm-hmm. and they had so thoroughly examined behavior in these types of situations that the modeling that they were doing, the equations, remember they're not important, don't be scared. Of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see that when I go to sleep still, Bill, it's terrible. <laughs> that a lot of what they were finding were some of the subtle nuances of what happened in those particular situations also seemed to be mimicked by other characteristics of bodies in time and space like friction and Hmm. gravity and rotation. I think most of that was really kind of nonsensical and moving way away from the data. But that's Hmm. kind of what you're supposed to do when you're modeling. You're attempting to bring these variables, given what you know about the results that you have in a way that you have a visual analog that's attempting to show us how these variables interact with one another. And it was very interesting to follow that line of work. But I'll be honest with you, at that point in time, I thought behavioral momentum was the stupidest thing (laughs) that I had ever come across. And now look at you. (laughs) Well, there's a story behind that. And part of it was that the early work that Nevin had done was something that wasn't as closely aligned with the work with pigeons that I was doing in graduate school. I was more interested in attempting to identify what are some of the aspects of schedules of reinforcement that produce bias for one kind of schedule versus another. That's really interesting for another talk. (laughs) Well, it's not irrelevant here, Uh so I'm just going to briefly mention it. One of the things that we know is if we have a variable schedule that has a mean value that's greater than a fixed schedule, Under many circumstances, we'll see a preference for that variable schedule if the minimal value of responding that will produce reinforcement is below the mean value of the fixed schedule. So uh, I was interested in examining that kind of work and making predictions about what would happen for behavior in those kinds of situations. Momentum from an applied perspective, I was doing feeding work at the Children's Seashore House where Bud Mace was doing this high P work and calling it behavioral momentum. Now, the reason why I didn't like behavioral momentum is that I thought Mace didn't know what he was talking about. Because 
this high p procedure was something that involved taking one class of behavior and using that class of behavior as a means of predicting what would happen with an entirely different class of behavior. I know you guys are going to talk about this later, but compliance with an instruction that has a high probability is probably maintained by positive reinforcement. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When behavior occurs in a situation where there's a low probability of compliance, that's probably not positive reinforcement, but <laughs> negative reinforcement. True. So the behavioral momentum analogy doesn't apply to right. different kinds of functional classes of responding. So that high P, low P procedure is something that I didn't feel was very well represented by the behavioral momentum metaphor. Not to mention that there was a lot of pressure being at the children's seashore house to attempt to use that instructional feeding procedure with our feeding work. Mm -hmm. But no matter how many bites of applesauce you give somebody, they're still probably not going to eat that piece of broccoli. <laughs> I might. <laughs> I well, do love applesauce. <laughs> I, I, I like broccoli um, and I like applesauce, but there's no way that if I'm eating applesauce, I'm going to switch over to broccoli. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's really mushy and overcooked. They, don't, that's true. they don't pair well, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no. They don't. No, no, no. But one thing I do love is... We, we t we'll talk about it again when we talk about the high P, low P sequence, is I love how professional uh, Nevin wrote the article, The Momentum of Compliance. So it wasn't like, you're wrong, like, this is the worst. He was like, maybe, but here's why it's probably not there. They're just two different things. Yeah, so I loved that, right? So he wasn't just... He wasn't it, was just like, it was a very diplomatic It was very diplomatic. Yes. Like, we don't really have steady state of responding, mm -hmm. so no. We're looking yeah. at two different things, so no... But let's keep talking about it. But it's probably not that. But I like that, right? So it's it's not it's not making it an us or them. It's yep. making us a discussion, which I think we need to do as researchers. Yeah. Totally. And certainly one of the things that is a real strength of that particular paper is Nevin takes what Mace is saying seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he describes exactly what that particular paradigm is and how it doesn't really match up. And the best way to um, get people to pay attention to what you have to say is to do it in a polite manner. And Tony Nevin was one of the most intelligent, professional, and polite people that I'd ever met. I'm going to agree with Absolutely. you there. Yeah. And there was a long collaboration that came from uh, Nevin and Mace's working together. And I uh, happened to have the good fortune of working together with them a little bit further down in my career. Uh, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Nice. Spoiler alert. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and what's that called? What's the lead in? Teaser. Teaser. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going from here, Rob? Well, I'm, so I'm kind of trying to think. So in terms of history, Bill, that would be... With, are we at the, kind of at the mid-90s now, or are we getting close to where you started looking at research related to behavioral momentum? Well, as I was looking at behavioral momentum that was being represented by the high P procedure or the incorrect usage of that particular term, the way that I had seen treatment failure sites was turned off from the entire area. And part of what I was much more interested in at that time was some of the work that Joe Lawley was doing uh, at the Sea Shore House. That was very influential on some of the clinical interventions that I had been working on and developing. But a, li a little beyond that, so after I started at the New England Center, about three years after I'd been doing feeding work, I started to work with kids that had stereotypic behavior. And at one point in time, I became irritated with something completely different. <laughs> this is so shocking to hear. <laughs> I think your mantra is like, if you're irritated about it, do something. <laughs> That's right. So how could I preach that without doing it myself? Right. One of the things that I was interested in when we were developing our studies for stereotypy is what was everybody else doing at the time? And some of what irritates me, I'll be perfectly honest with you is uh, wording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't say something correctly, it just doesn't sound correct. 
Sure. Those people who are applied behavior analysts out there, when you talk to your applied behavior analytic colleagues, speak behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, we're going to shun you. <laughs> that has been the case. Yeah. Well, we take a lot of pride, I think, in our behavior analytic language that we share as a community. And mm -hmm. it's taken a lot of work to be fluent in that language. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there's so much afforded by the particular perspective that we're somewhat yeah. right, thrown off by those that call themselves part of the community that are not part of the verbal community mm -hmm. of behavior analysis 24-7, mm -hmm. 365. <laughs> well, I think there's a time and a place. <laughs> yes, I call that like when you're dreaming or at some other point in time. But it was certainly the case that there were a number of studies that suggested automatically reinforced behavior could be treated effectively through response blocking. That certainly is an intrusive intervention mm -hmm. and not where we necessarily would want to start, right? Mm -hmm. We're interested in having a least intrusive yet effective approach. Mm -hmm. So the other literature that was out there suggested that things like DRO and, here's the bad word, non-contingent reinforcement. Gotcha. <laughs> I actually think the bad word is DRO, too. I'm like, I'm well, not a big fan yeah, of DROs. That is, you, you have brought that up. You can... I don't love slapping DROs on it. <laughs> right. DROs suck. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where I got it from. <laughs> I, know, right? I, feel, yeah. I, I do want to say, I believe I saw you talk once, and I think, I'm going to I think this was a quote, was DRO... It might have been that shitty ass procedure. <laughs> it might be misremembering. Uh, but I think I put that in my notes. I was like, mm, this is important. Right. I've tried to curse a lot less. So now when I talk about people using DROs, I just try to tell them to not suck as a behavior animal. <laughs> Choose a DRA or DRI. You're so much better off. Than Any other DRA. DR. <laughs> That's funny. But anyway. So anyways, non-contingent reinforcement uh, as a particular procedure to be honest, it is, it, it's certainly the case that that kind of a strategy comes from a long history of thinking that an enriched environment mm -hmm. is a better place for behavior to be occurring than in an impoverished environment. And certainly there's validity to that assertion, but there's also danger adopting that as a general approach. We enrich the environment. We could also be making it more likely for problem behavior to be occurring if it is a certain kind of problem behavior. Right, or mm -hmm. more likely that no behavior occurs, right? Exactly, or no appropriate behavior. Right. You yeah. might be making inappropriate yeah. behavior occur. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But nonetheless, the early work in that area was kind of interesting. Volmer, Marcus, and LeBlanc did a very nice study that took into consideration preference when it came to identifying kinds of activities that we should enrich the environment with. And then a really important turn happened when Piazza and colleagues developed a duration-based assessment to predict what sorts of activities would be effective in competing with problem behavior. That competing stimulus approach is one thoughtful way of crafting a non-contingent reinforce. I'm not going to say it anymore because I don't say <laughs> non-blue-blue blue all day long. <laughs> right? But um, those competing stimulus types of approaches right. have uh, have real utility, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have automatically reinforced self-injurious behavior. You will do anything to enrich the environment that will produce a lower level of uh, self-injurious behavior. But stereotypy is not self-injurious behavior. Mm -hmm. To stick with a type of a procedure where we're going to take uh, something like hand flapping or vocal stereotypy and we're going to give the hand flapper two slinkies and have them, you know, instead of flapping their hands, flap their hands with two slinkies in them. That's not really much of a change in right. behavior. Nope. Mm -hmm. Just makes it bigger. It right. could Probably lead to aggression. Fun, yeah. Then we have socially maintained behavior <laughs> right. that we could maybe treat. Uh, but there's certainly... No harm in identifying functional activities that right. effectively compete. So that general strategy that Piazza and colleagues had developed is certainly a good one, but their initial approach was looking at matching stimulation. So part of what I had been working on, in addition to developing assessments and treatments for stereotypic behavior, I was working with Bill Doobie, and some of our work with Tony Nevin and Bud Mace and Willie DeLeon and Tim Sheehan was looking at behavior in multiple schedule arrangements and seeing 
how that behavioral momentum metaphor applied across different species. So there was work ongoing with pigeons. There was work ongoing with students at the New England Center. Ironically, the kind of work that was going on with them really wasn't with problem behavior, but rather their behavior playing video games mm -hmm. <laughs> and bringing their behavior under the control of different schedules of reinforcement and seeing what happened when you changed things about the arrangement. And this was all under a grant, correct? So you guys were working right. under this a was grant a, across an NIH organizations. Grant. Yeah, so that's awesome. Right? It was a well, program awesome. project grant, yeah. and it was inspiring in a number of ways. One of the things that it inspired us to, to look at was how can we show other people that non-contingent reinforcement might work but it's still not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that was the first study that I ever developed for behavioral momentum. And of course it is coming such. from an evil place. <laughs> oh, but it's such a cool study. <laughs> uh, it is a pretty cool study. Yeah. And then we'll talk about the really interesting studies that you guys did, which um, have very different implications because the work that we did was pretty much an analog to other behavioral momentum work that had been done. We established a behavior under a schedule of reinforcement, or we examined it happening. Right. And then we did other things such as making there be more reinforcement in that environment mm -hmm. where the behavior is occurring, mm -hmm. and then doing something to disrupt the behavior. I hope you have some good stories to tell about your thesis. Uh, but one of the interesting things about the 2003 study is the first kid in that study is also the first kid in the 2007 RIRD study. Oh. So part of what oh, there we, you were, go. we were examining were different kinds of interventions relative to his vocal stereotypy. So what we arranged there is for stereotypy to be freely occurring. And then after that, we added in reinforcement in the form of access to competing activities that are very similar to the kind of non-contingent reinforcement intervention uh, that is examined in those Piazza at all 1998-2000 Java studies. With that particular paradigm, we thought one of the things that might be possible if we use that environmental enrichment NCR competing stimulus approach we might find that that creates a situation whereby behavior is worse off after that intervention right. than it would would be if you had done nothing at all. And you wouldn't have thought of that, right? Like that's not something that someone would have been like, oh, I wonder if this is actually going to hurt rather than benefit, right? Because mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I'm adding all this great stuff. I'm doing yeah. something. Right. I'm doing something that's good right in that moment. It's just the same as the idea of like the sensory diet, right? Like, right. oh, let's play with the bean bin right now. And that seems like it's a lower stereotypy. But later on, that could definitely have adverse effects regarding. Mm -hmm. It could create momentum right. such right. that behavior persists <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. rather than being less likely to occur. So there's some suggestion that you might be abolishing the reinforcing mm -hmm. efficacy of the response class, but the reverse might be true. So what we did is we set up a situation where stereotypy would meet that environmental enrichment type of procedure, and we compared that to what would happen if we did absolutely nothing at all. And in both of those situations, we then presented a disruptor, right? The most competing activity that we had was our disruptor. Mm -hmm. And what we found for all of the participants in our study, that the non-contingent reinforcement-like approach produced a higher level of problem behavior than if we had done nothing at all. It's pretty depressing, isn't it? That it's is. a little bit. So <laughs> it's a little bit depressing. No, and that's so, always depressing. Yeah. There's nothing worse than like, I tried so hard and it was and it failed. the worst situation. So the, the disruptor outcome. that you used, so if anyone wanted to look at this, the disruptor was a was a very preferred activity, right? Right. We used activities that were preferred the for the disruptor. disruptor. And for the environmental enrichment, right. but they were separate activities. And so when you, so you had them play, they were, you know, engaging in stereotypy, then you included the disruptor, and then did you measure the, the stereotypic behavior during disruption or after disruption? At all times. Right. We had so that's baseline. important to know. Just proportion of baseline. Yep. That's right. Yep. And one of the things that we do generally with the momentum metaphor is we take a look at behavior relative to its baseline state. Right. So when we look at proportionally how behavior changes, for instance, whenever we do an intervention, you have 
behavior that's maintained by um, access to positive reinforcement and you put a procedure in place whereby you're teaching bands for that and uh, what you're really interested in at some level is how much less problem behavior do you have during this treatment relative to baseline. You might say that 80% less is a good bar to say that you have an effective intervention, but what you're doing there is you're examining the level and baseline versus the level in treatment. You could do the same thing by doing a little math. I'm sorry. No. It's I, just division. Actually, I'm not scared of division. I'm, I'm not scared of division either, and I even am very bad at math. <laughs> I actually love looking at responding in these relative rates because I remember us like pouring over that Lerman and, and colleagues' 1996 article and, and kind of thinking about how behavior – in both baselines, when they were looking at continuous schedule of reinforcement and intermittent schedule of reinforcement, were different. So there was like higher rates of behavior in that intermittent schedule and lower rates in that continuous schedule of reinforcement. But then we were just like, oh, look, it got, it, it did something different, but we couldn't really compare across the two. And I loved how you made me do all of those lines. <laughs> because I wouldn't have. You just have keep a, coming back. You just I keep know, back because to it. I don't think I would have grasped that concept that you can't compare two different baselines that are at right. differing mm-hmm. differing rates to how how it is different in treatment because they're they're not the same. Mm-hmm. So I think that's sometimes that people lose when they're talking about the momentum metaphor is that you're when you're just carrying baseline treatment, baseline treatment, yeah, they both decrease, but you can't really talk about how much. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just want to pause the conversation one second to let our listeners know our first secret code word. In case you didn't know, ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. So by listening to the show, you are able to apply for one continuing education credit, type two. And you just need to go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen CEUs to apply. But in addition to some information about yourself, you'll also need two secret code words that we sprinkled throughout the episode. And I'm about to give you that first one. It is flavor, F. L-A-V-O-R, flavor. Where are you right now? Why, you're in flavor country because of the flavor of whatever. I think that was a cigarette commercial. Yuck. That's not a good flavor. Yuck. Uh, Let's think of something more pleasant. Candy. That's a good flavor. Flavor. So one of the things that came from that particular line of research was we identified situations in which using a reinforcement-based intervention, we decrease behavior, or at least we hope we're decreasing behavior. Right. One of the three participants in the 2003 study, there was in fact no decrease in their stereotypic behavior by using stimuli that in an assessment had effectively competed. The results for the other two participants were not incredibly impressive in terms of how much less sure. responding we mm-hmm. had. So if you're mm-hmm. producing a little less responding... But now you have a lot more responding when that is no longer in place. Well, then that's probably a really bad situation. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's not where you really want to be. No, it is definitely not where you want to be. And as we've learned uh, later with subsequent studies, it seems the non-contingent reinforcement approach can be made to work better. It can be used in a more thoughtful manner Mm -hmm. and um, ultimately... The goal needs to be functionally engaging right. with those activities rather than merely being in contact with those activities and engaging them in a repetitive mm-hmm. fashion. Mm-hmm. I think that makes sense. And the question could be, you know, where is it most valuable to see the decrease in stereotypic behavior, right? So if your marginally competing items are presented during times in which you're trying to establish attending or do skill acquisition tasks versus your super disruptive items being present during break time, right? Yeah. Well, then it's actually more valuable to effectively compete with them versus looking at maybe the latter effects of how that may be affecting momentum. Certainly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So when we look at that type of an outcome, if it was just a non-contingent reinforcement type of an approach that produces that outcome, it, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be so worrisome because you would say, just don't do that. 
Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> any reinforcement-based intervention <laughs> seems to potentially create more response persistence mm -hmm. for problem behavior. So if we provide reinforcement for alternative behavior, like in a DRA, uh, or we use an omission contingency like the DRO, that sucky type of mm -hmm. procedure that we should We avoid. should not talk about. <laughs> Uh, we could talk about it. We just should talk about it in a way that <laughs> makes no one want to do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we should reinforce BCBAs responding to any other schedule other than a DRO. Is That's that what right. I'm hearing? Okay, just making right. sure. And target appropriate behavior because sometimes then you don't need to target inappropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. But overall, any reinforcement-based intervention, if we reinforce alternative behavior in the context in which problem behavior has met reinforcement, it might have the unfortunate side effect of making the problem behavior more persistent. Especially if it's in the same response class, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mind blown. I hate to pause a conversation in midstream, but before we get to those articles, why don't we take a little break? We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time www.regiscollege.edu See you there! And we're back discussing behavioral momentum with both our special guests slash co-hosts Jackie and Diana and of course our very special guest Dr. Bill Ahern. Everyone's well, mind just what? exploded. No. <laughs> now what? Well, we got to hold Brain that one bits. to the very end. <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise people are going to turn off. Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. So I think maybe we should talk about some of the other studies. All right. Yeah. yeah. Sounds you were good. working on your master's thesis at about the time that we were running this study. So why don't you tell us why you were interested in doing what you were doing? Oh. Well. <laughs> Challenge accepted. I know, right? yeah. Yeah. That one, no. I, yeah, I don't remember. You're not off I the hook yet either. <laughs> You're I, next. Know, I know the reason. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> we could cut that part out. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it in. Yeah, well, I just want to say first that I, you know, back when I read the 2003 study the first time through, I just didn't realize how awesome a study it is. No, me neither. And no, how neither. sophisticated the question that you were asking mm -hmm. was. I was just Me like, neither. oh, yeah, this is just like people do this type of research. And, and, they're, just research. Using, and they're using bar graphs. I love bar graphs. <laughs> I actually remember being like, they're bar graphs. You do yeah. love bar graphs. Then, that is true. That's know. a fact. I'm really glad you appreciated it because four really out of the five do. reviewers rejected the study from Java. Well, Ooh. that's also a good tidbit. So it's a good tidbit to is know. That, is that one of those just, after, you know, time passes and, and you look back and you're like, wow, there's so much more... You know, th this research is so much more meaningful. We just didn't realize it at the time or just... Well, he realized it because he did it. Well, I, know, I know you realized it, but... Bill's but real I'll, I'll, I'll be honest kinda... with you. I didn't really think that was that important of a study when we finished the study because it was a marginal effect. It was real and mm -hmm. it was consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But until somebody else replicates it, that isn't us. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to believe it. So... I like that. <laughs> Take home point of tonight. Have other people replicate your stuff. <laughs> Right. Make sure everybody knows what you did so that right. they can try to do it too. So mm -hmm. they don't call you at like 10 p.m. Was there an adult confederate? <laughs> I didn't even talk about the momentum effect that often mm -mm. relative to treating stereotypy until Willie Daly unreplicated mm -hmm. the outcome. And part of what it certainly was at the time 
it was a different kind of study. I I wasn't sure yeah. that it would get accepted in Java, and I think the four reviewers that rejected it, I kind of think I know who at least a couple of them. <laughs> and um, you've spited them for not life. at all. They had yeah. in, the incredibly insightful comments that were useful because to me the procedures that we put together made a lot of sense. Um, they were procedures that I had talked to uh, Bill Duby about and. We had trialed them out and had some success with them, but it it certainly was the case that those reviewers were not prepared for that type of a preparation. Right. And Dorothy Lerman was the AE for that paper, if I'm recalling correctly. If not, it's all the concussions. <laughs> but she accepted the paper. The reviewer that suggested that it be accepted was Tony Nevin. Uh, oh, so I He's like, I love this paper! <laughs> he signed it, so it's not yeah. like, I guess that one. Uh, and um, his comments were very helpful and, and resulted in us analyzing our data in a slightly different way that came out in in the published study. To some extent, when you come up with that type of an outcome that is consistent, uh, it's important to make sure that there isn't something about the way that you are doing it that was producing the outcome as opposed to it being a real phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Phenomenon. I like that. (laughs) Well, Okay, that's fair. The only thing I remember about your study, so Diane and I were in the same life sphere at this point. We were friends. Um, And I remember that whoever was presenting your study would always draw a little TV in the corner. That was like one of the disruptors. Oh. And you would click on the TV and then a video would show. And I, I remember have no memory of what you're talking because about. Because I at loved. All. Do you remember? I, I remember. Of the course, t- I remember. I remember the very first participant that yeah. uh, was in this study. The TV was amazing. It wasn't TV with him. It no. was a game that was being played uh, mm-hmm. online. It was some sort of driving game. Yep. With a TV a, icon. Yes, and <laughs> the inspiration for that study was really the work that Bill Duby had been doing with the Goop program, mm-hmm. and uh, the way that that question sort of came about. You were working in more of an academically oriented environment, kids that were learning. Yep. And the study that you were replicating really nicely translated into what are the best kinds of schedules of reinforcement for maintaining behavior when you're teaching skills and maintaining skills so that they'll be more likely to persist in the face of disruption or distraction. Yeah. Yeah. So now do you remember? I I do. I <laughs> It was part of the don't... grant. Yeah. It was part of the big grant. I remember sitting in a meeting with you and you and you were there and you were there and Bill Duby <laughs> was, was, was there and Evan was there. And it was like an Iowa study. Anybody that walked by was an author. Yeah. And, and Kira was <laughs> I know, there this at study one has point. seven authors. Yeah. So yes. It's unusual. It's the but dreaded number seven. Mm-hmm. Poor number six. <laughs> Don't get listed. Doobie. At all. Is it him? Yep. No, it's Loeb. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I honestly don't remember the origin story of how I ended up with this topic, to be perfectly honest with you, Bill. I was your student, and I think you said, you should do momentum. And I said, okay. It's so easy. What's momentum? <laughs> <laughs> you must have asked the question, what should I do for my thesis? That yeah. must be what happened. And we must have been in the old research office sitting near Bill Doobie, and it's mm-hmm. like, hey, yeah. Maybe we should do some of this. I think that's it was right happened. next door, I think. Yep. So what's your thesis you right all about? Hall. So my thesis is titled Resistance to Disruption in a Classroom Setting. And it was largely replicating and extending Mace and Lolly 1990, in which they compared multiple schedule sorting silverware and introducing disruptors and evaluating the behavioral momentum metaphor in more of an applied real-world type environment. But we wanted to look at the same type of a scenario, but with children who are diagnosed with autism and learning in a more separate environment. So the question here, and the way that this ties into momentum and some of the larger things that we think about when we're teaching young kids, is that very often we start out by teaching skills using a FR1 CRF schedule, right? And as that skill uh, develops, we see it occurring at strength, then we say, well, now let's thin out that schedule, right? so that the behavior will maintain or persist. However, if we think about a less dense schedule of reinforcement, 
as compared to a more dense schedule of reinforcement, in the context of the behavioral momentum metaphor, we would expect that behavior that is under the control of a less dense schedule of reinforcement would in fact be less resistant to disruption or extinction or satiation than a more dense schedule of reinforcement. So it's like counterintuitive to the way that we typically teach skills. And that we still do teach skills mm-hmm. sometimes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. So that was the kind of the question that we wanted to approach here. So we had two different groups of kids and some of them were students that I ran the sessions with directly. But again, this was part of like a bigger grant. So Mm -hmm. some of the work I inherited as part of my thesis. You wouldn't have inherited it if you didn't take the IOA data. Oh, maybe that is what (laughs) happened. (laughs) So there were six boys in the study. Uh, Five of them had a diagnosis of either PDD or autism. And then one had an ADHD and OCD diagnosis. All of them attended a school for children with autism and related disabilities, and five of them attended a day program, and one of them attended a residential program. They were ages 4 to 13, and two of them, Ben and Cody, were performing uh, mostly in academic classrooms. They did a lot of their work in that environment. I just realized we have the same kid name. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I didn't realize that either. Huh. Kid. Go us. Twinsies for life. And it's not Bill. Nope, and it's not, <laughs> not Bill. Bill. <laughs> Next time, Bill. <laughs> Why, which name? Cody. Oh, yeah. That was just I, the hot research name in the I guess. late 2000s. Maybe we both had a crush on a guy named Cody before <laughs> right? you, Rob. Is it from Boy Meets World? <laughs> no, yep. wait. Uh, I feel like we... <laughs> I thought it, it actually on. is. Uh, I amazing. thought it was The Sweet Life. Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's next. It's much more recent than our childhood. <laughs> I still watch it, though. <laughs> uh, so so they did some different types of tasks than the other four participants did. But the preparation across both of those groups was the same. So it was a multiple schedule, meaning the schedules were signaled, right? But they uh, each produced reinforcement within the schedule. And we didn't have the same exact responses across schedules. They were ideally similarly difficult response classes. So the way it was presented, it was organized where... Each participant experienced six little mini components per session that were 90 seconds long. And during those sessions, half of them, in alternating order, were either receiving reinforcement on a variable interval 7-second schedule or a variable interval 30-second schedule. Okay, And uh, we were looking initially just to see stable rates of responding in the, across those two conditions. So first, let me tell you what the behaviors were. Yeah. Were, they, right? Okay, so Ben and Cody, the two guys I mentioned earlier, were a little bit older, and they had different types of problems that they were working on on worksheets. So they had math worksheets and they had spelling worksheets. These were great. All we had to do was go through at the end and determine how many marks they made on a page, and that was our dependent variable that we interpreted into rate of responding. Easy peasy. There you go. Okay? Now, our other four participants, Paul... John, Ryan, and Noah uh, had tasks that weren't weren't uh, really as much academic tasks, but they were tasks that they could complete with their hands. So we used three different tasks. Each of them experienced two of the tasks, and they were stringing beads, assembling blocks like Duplo blocks, or putting together a puzzle. So while I said like those worksheets were real easy, right? You just went through and you're like boop 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 boop. There were like thirty responses. Not for the blocks, the bees, and the puzzle. So for these, we had a video camera. We recorded all the sessions. And then we went through using, guess what, guys? A frame-by-frame coder. Oh, yes. I think I remember you scoring these. I think I came to, to visit one day. We'd bring you lunch or something. I spent a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> recording these frame-by-frame frame in order to determine how many responses occurred during the sessions. And... Uh, for each of the types of responding, there were different components of the response that counted as a response. So for bead stringing, for example, touching the tip of the string to the bead counted as a response, pushing the string through the bead counted as a response, and pulling the string out on the other side counted as a, as a response. So putting a bead on a string was actually counted as three responses in order to account for times where you might attempt to put a bead on a string and, and not fully get it on there, etc. When it doesn't work out. Right, yeah. <laughs> Right, you know, you've been there. I have. I'm like, oh, it's bead. Yeah. Blocks were similar. It was like stacking them, taking them apart, touching them together, things like that. The kicker 
was the puzzle. Because the puzzle, I'm not going to get them all right, but it was like sliding a piece, picking up a piece, putting down a piece, touching a tip of the piece to the puzzle, and fully putting a piece in the puzzle. My thesis was so much easier. Oh. <laughs> Do you regret that the puzzle was one of the... Well, I'm actually going to get to that. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so... Sounds like a lot of whining. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, what are you trying to say? <laughs> No, I had so much fun. It was Apparently. such a great experience. The fact that I remember those definitions might indicate some level of trauma. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a lot of years. Yes. So so that was how we recorded our dependent variable. Uh, we initially established a baseline rate of steady state responding across those two schedules. One was the VI 7 second, one was the VI 30 second, and for each one they had one of those tasks assigned, right? So like someone had blocks for VI 7 and beads for VI 30, etc. So once we had a steady state of responding and baseline, we then went on to the test condition. And the test condition was just like the baseline in that the first four sessions, nothing changed, right? It was VI 7, VI 30, VI 7, VI 30. But the last two, the fifth and the sixth components, we introduced a disruptor of some type that was generally a preferred item. So something like a video game, a toy, and very often a DVD. This was back in the days where we had these like portable DVD players. I remember that. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, yeah. I even had the the, the, the TV with the little VCR at our house. Well, right? that. Pre-iPad where you could just, oh, just, you know, you, you, you pull up YouTube real quick. Nope. No iPad. No, you had to have like the disc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That or um, someone had a musical book that they like to press the buttons on. So we would, uh, continue to have the task present so they could still get reinforcement for engaging in the task on the same schedule. But now we just slid across the table this other super exciting fun item. Right? Seems so mean. So mean. <laughs> well, it's intended to mimic sort of the I everyday know, know. scenario, right? So you learn something in isolation. You can do it. You've thinned out the schedule of reinforcement. But now let's put it into a real life scenario where suddenly you're in the gym, right? And there's all these exciting, fun things happening. Are you still going to respond in the same way? Guess what? You are not, right? No. So in both scenarios, the disrupting item was disrupting. But what we found was consistent with behavioral momentum theory that the items that were had been reinforced on the more dense schedule continued to occur at a higher rate relative to baseline and then, than behavior that was reinforced on a less dense schedule. For five of six participants. Ooh. Yeah. Is it a theory now? Well, uh, if you want to call it a theory, lots of people have. Right. It, I remember um, saying that once and you were like, it is not a theory, Jackie. Well, it that's is a phenomenon or a, a metaphor. Long time, metaphor. Tony Nevin was resistant to sure. referring to it as a theory. He felt it did not yet have the status of theory. Which so I like. Don't you like that? The, yes, I do. It gets yeah. to the point where people are now calling it theory, theory, and Nevin and Shahan examined behavioral momentum with conditional discriminations, and it kind of doesn't work anymore. So uh, now it's a disproven theory, kind of like the matching law and any other theory that's going to come around. You're going to see what are the limits of that particular theory, mm -hmm. although it still allows us to ask questions about what happens in particular important yeah. real-life types of situations. And um, Peter Colleen and Tony Nevin, shortly before Tony passed away, have a really nice extension of the uh, phenomena studied under the behavioral momentum metaphor. I'll stick with the metaphor. Yeah. Okay. I just remember. I don't know what I just said, so I apologize. It doesn't matter. You could say theory. You could say <laughs> metaphor. It is used somewhat interchangeably mm -hmm. now. All right. So as you mentioned, Rob, about those puzzles, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the... Potential limitations here is that we had behavior that we you know, sort of hoped was about the same response effort that was assigned to the two different schedules, but it's difficult to know for sure, right? And the blocks and the beads, just anecdotally, seem to be about equivalent, but for some participants, the puzzle did seem to be harder to mm -hmm. do, right? And it was also just more challenging to, to determine, and it is a little bit arbitrary, right, deciding which components of puzzling counted as a response <laughs> which is what didn't it's your favorite right? i do love puzzling you do yeah i do 
uh, but not to code it frame by frame, oh. surprisingly. <laughs> huh. I wonder if that's why you picked it. You're like, I love puzzling. I want to watch it. Well, that's why we got it. married. I like making puzzles in the den. I like coding my puzzling behavior frame by frame. You know, and then graphing it. Our early it. days. That's a proportion baseline. <laughs> I was there too, don't forget. And then she gives me those Thomas the Tank Engine books that make noise. And how distracted do I get? It's a lot of fun. We have a great time here. <laughs> All right. I was doing Iowa. Um. <laughs> that does sound like our relationship. It really does. <laughs> So much high fiving. That's uh, funny. Yeah, so there, I, there is a little bit of that concern for me at least. Is was the puzzle too different? And the other thing to to note, and this was I think just completely arbitrary assignment, is that the puzzle was only assigned on the VI thirty second schedule. Mm-hmm. So something to keep in mind for anyone who wants to do this again. It hasn't been replicated in that context. Uh, no. So they should. Yeah, mine hasn't been either. As far as I know. Was this a good segue into into your study, Jackie? Yeah. Do you remember why I started mine? I sure do. Do you? <laughs> I remember that I was working on something else for an entire <laughs> year. And I think it was NCR. <laughs> Might I, have been. I believe it was a study on, MCR, on NCR with one of my students that I was working with. And it was not going well. Like nothing was going well, I remember. And they had like six months left to go before I was going to graduate. Yeah. And I remember crying. I remember the crying. There was a lot of crying. I remember crying and you're like, yeah, it's not working I don't out. remember the crying part. Well, that's good. Right. I that probably wasn't crying with you. Ex- no, you probably did. Yeah. I just don't pay any attention to it. <laughs> yeah. But then you said, well, you're looking at this behavior that's not changing. And it was problem behavior. So maybe you could look at it you know, in a different way. And I was like, yeah, I love looking at things in a different way, probably exactly like that. And you're like, oh, naive Jackie. (laughs) And so we started looking at what happens with problem behavior with the functional analysis and then treatment. So I think my paper is more of a translational paper. Do you agree? It certainly is. And one of the sort of inspirations to the, the question was there were some people that were critical of the functional analysis method. There are lots of people critical of the functional Mm -hmm. analysis methodology. They can all go to hell um, (laughs) because it is one of the pinnacle achievements (laughs) of applied behavior analysis. But anyways, I don't really believe in hell, so you could take that particular comment for Mm -hmm. whatever it's worth, which is less than nothing. But when we think about... A particular kind of criticism that was out there. One of the things that was suggested as a reason why the functional analysis was effective in developing treatment strategies was that some people thought that you were taking problem behavior that was maintained on some intermittent schedule of reinforcement in the natural environment. You then did a functional analysis where you're using a continuous schedule of reinforcement and that that continuous schedule of reinforcement would make the behavior easier to treat. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. I didn't know anything at that point. I just knew that those people were wrong. (laughs) I didn't. I didn't actually know anything. I remember you giving me the Nevin and Grace article, and you're like, read this this weekend. And I was like, yay. And I sat down. I was like, what (laughs) is is happening? (laughs) If anyone, if it makes anyone feel better, I think that it took me like, six years to like really mm-hmm. like grasp everything in that article and the behavioral and brain sciences 2000 yep. nevin and grace mm-hmm. that grace one and nevin. you gave me the, br- the brain and behavioral sciences actual like real like tangible a piece of paper no the whole all thing the yeah like oh, the, the whole, whole journal, journal. <laughs> with the comments the whole journal and you're like read this and i was like this is gonna be so fun and i sat down and i was like no what have i got myself into but it was good, and it was very, I mean, like, my procedures were very easy. It was a relatively simple um, question was. to ask. Mm-hmm. Does placing behavior on a continuous schedule of reinforcement relative to placing it on an intermittent schedule of reinforcement prior to implementing extinction, is there some consistent effect that comes from those schedules of reinforcement? Right, and one thing that we did that we thought extended the literature was we looked at uh, brief multiple interactions between the the reinforcement contingencies 
uh, or the reinforcement conditions and the extinction because Sidman in 1960 suggested that you could look at extinction in one condition, right, and maybe the first time, and it would look very different from the second and third time. So that's why we did those multiple brief interactions with the reinforcement conditions and the extinction conditions. So that was neat. That was totally all you. I don't think I... (laughs) <laughs> that was that was at all me because I, well, I think it was all you because I don't remember running any sessions. No, I ran all the sessions, <laughs> but I think conceptually, I wasn't there yet. But I'm getting there, so that's good. So it's why don't hope. you tell us what happened and what you got? Yeah, so we I, I remember running three of the four participants. I think I Stacy Bancroft uh, ran the other one. I think. Okay, good. Yeah, because yeah. I was like I remember running three. One of them is iffy, but I remember doing IOA, so that's probably why I got here. And three of the participants I was actually working with in my classroom, uh, they were all boys diagnosed with autism. I can't remember their ages, but they were probably between 7 and 11, because that is the age I was working with. And the other student was the student Stacy was working with right. at the time. Right, yep. When she was Stacy Fitch. Right. How do I ever remember two I, last names? Right. That, never that was good. And so, <laughs> equivalence class. <laughs> it's amazing. For two of our participants, uh, we defined aggression as, you know, the grabbing, hitting, pinching, everything you can do. One of our participants had hand biting, and then one of our participants had engaged in whining behavior, which we all love. The worst Whining is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> it is fabulous. If that's what you do, that's pretty good. And so, what we did is we. Um, had some conditions where our first condition was our social social interaction condition where the participants were given two moderately preferred toys and they could just play with them and I was just in the room with them. And surprisingly, we were all surprised with this, I think, none of the participants engaged in any problem behavior during the social interaction condition, but all of their problem behavior was at least socially mediated in some form. Hmm. Right, two of them had escape maintained problem behavior and two had attention maintained problem yeah. behavior. Did you do that on purpose, though? Yes. Yeah, that was good. Um, and two of them we calculated using frequency and two we calculated using duration. Did you mm. do that on purpose, too? That was because of the nature of, of the, the responses that they were emitting. If yeah. it looked like frequency was the better measure, we used frequency. Yeah. If it looked, uh, we used rate. If it um, was behavior that had duration, then we needed to capture it in the Right. in which it was occurring across the entire session. Yeah, but I found that. I was like, wow, that is so equal. <laughs> and so what we did is we had a five-minute session of no social interaction first, and then we ran um, a reinforcement condition. So it was either continuous reinforcement, delivered contingent on whatever the problem behavior was, or an intermittent schedule of reinforcement delivered on whatever the problem behavior was, followed by five minutes of extinction, followed by five minutes of no social interaction again. So I think... One of the interesting things is that those two items competed in all cases with the problem behavior because we saw no problem behavior in all the social interactions. That was kind of by design, too, because yeah. we excluded any any students from participating in that study if they had severe problem behavior. Right, that is true. Uh, mm-hmm. Because there's the possibility that during this study, their behavior might get a little bit worse. So we wouldn't oh. have done right. that with any severe problem right. behavior. Right, yeah. Or unsuspecting Jackie. Your extinction condition. <laughs> like, good luck, Jackie. Have fun. I hope you're geared up. Um, but yeah, it was very simple. So we we think we used a random generator where we were going, like a random number generator, to tell us which condition. Yeah, that was a procedure that Bill Doobie had put together. Mm-hmm. And, and, I remember that being like, yeah. this is so fascinating. <laughs> um, whether we were running a continuous reinforcement condition or an intermittent reinforcement condition for that day, so only one condition was run each day, and we ran the four test conditions, and then we just looked at what we found, and it was fascinating that every one of our participants, we saw more persistence following the continuous schedule of reinforcement than the intermittent schedule of reinforcement. Which is counter to that criticism that some people had of the functional analysis Mm -hmm. methodology. So there you go, anti-functional analysis methodology people, you are wrong once again. (laughs) Yeah, And there you have it. (laughs) There you go. I was very excited that I do love the bar graph for some reason. It's like my it's like my soul made of graphs. Oh yeah. I never get to use it. And I think this is one of the reasons that lured me into doing this because you gave me your two thousand three article as well and I was like, There's bar graphs. I love myself a bar graph. But I didn't know what I was getting into. Right. Um, Well did you know the what you need to do to get to the bar graph. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the nice thing that I think this study does as well as the Ahern 2003 study is they show the actual 
the frequency and duration of behavior, and then they show the proportion. So you get to see both. You see to see what actually happened, and then you can see the proportion relative to baseline. Yeah. So what we looked at was the proportion of, I think it was reinforcement, or, yep, the reinforcement condition over extinction to look at that proportion. Mm -hmm. So neat. Over lots of different sessions. Yeah. So which of those reinforcement conditions was more likely to be associated with an extinction burst? That would I be believe continuous it's... reinforcement. You're what right. Yeah. Yeah. So boom, they're wrong and <laughs> really, really wrong. In yeah. fact, that approach, continuously reinforcing behavior, can make behavior worse. So mm -hmm. if you use the functional analysis methodology and your treatment outcomes are better than if you don't use it, which seems to be very well established in the right. literature, then it can't be the functional analysis is making it easier to treat because of the continuous reinforcement of the problem behavior during the assessment. Right. It has to be that you're precisely identifying the function of behavior, which then leads you to a class of intervention strategies that have been shown to be effective for that kind of problem behavior. That is true. And that's why that was published in the special issue on the celebrating the 20th anniversary of the functional analysis methodology. It was. That was a good. That was a good issue. That it was, was slightly a good different issue. color. I can see yep. it on my shelf. It. Yay, Brian Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I remember. I was very excited. I'm mm. consistently amazed by how consistent the findings are. Right. Or yeah. The published findings, I guess. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it really does. It really works. Mm -hmm. And they're Behavior not little. really conforms. And they're not little. They're not little changes. Like, yeah. if you look at the proportion relative, I'm looking at yeah. them right now at the graph, it's like, bam, black bars are so high, and white bars are so little. <laughs> that was a good description. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just bringing it down for everyone. So they can be like, oh, I'll understand this graph. Big. Yep. There's yeah. big bars and little bars. So, Bill, you mentioned before we started uh, recording some, some kind of current current research in the behavioral momentum field. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there have been a number of ideas about what do you do when problem behavior is gathering more momentum and is more resistant because our gold standard intervention, what is generally shown to be the most effective strategy when we have problem behavior is once we've identified the function using differential reinforcement either with or without extinction. And if that's a good treatment, which it is, how can we mitigate the persistence building effects of reinforcing alternative behavior in the context in which problem behavior used to meet reinforcement if it's meeting extinction or maybe continues to meet reinforcement if you're not? There were a number of studies. MACE had a study published in 2010, but I don't, don't want to talk about that one because it is such convoluted schedules of reinforcement that uh, it's really hard to follow, although the phenomenon generally is the same outcome in that you, with differential reinforcement, see more persistence of problem behavior. Uh, Chris Podlesnik and some colleagues uh, shortly after then I think it was 2012, although I don't, years are not my strength, but uh, people and their studies are. Chris Podlesnik is a fabulous researcher, and one of the nice studies that he did is he replicated Mace's procedures, which were kind of complicated, and I don't really follow the logic as to why he chose them, but they were different enough that you could identify the phenomenon. But Chris was working with pigeons and used simpler schedules of reinforcement and came up with the same general outcome. And what the Podlesnik et al. study suggested was that if you reshape, reinforce, and establish that alternative response in a context in which problem behavior has never been reinforced, and then introduce the problem behavior treatment and the appropriate behavior intervention together after they've been separately trained, that you mitigate the um, persistence building effects. And currently, Cormac McManus is replicating that with students at the New England Center for his dissertation. I saw I saw that discussion, I think, one time at a, a squab. 
I believe. Or AVI. I, I believe the first time I saw it was the last time I was at Squab. Yeah, which was and it was a few years back. so fascinating. And I was like, whoa, yes. someone thought of this. Mm-hmm. Cool. That, and Cormac is presenting at this year's ABBA. Oh, the, yay, David Cormac. Was making up his dissertation. He hopes that his committee will find it worthy of <sighs> passing him. And I certainly think it will. But one of the general outcomes is that if you're going to be dealing with problem behavior that you think might be likely to occur again in the future, I mean all problem behavior. All problem behavior. Yeah. Right? And that phenomenon is something that you should be planning for if you don't suck as a behavior analyst, (laughs) that it's going to occur again and meet reinforcement later. You might want to consider using some unique discriminative stimuli to introduce into the environment while you're training the appropriate alternative, the functional alternative, hopefully, or with automatically reinforced behavior, whatever the alternative response is, um, in a context that problem behavior is not met reinforcement in. If you do that, what our data, Chris Podlesnik's data mm-hmm. and Bud Mace's data, would suggest is that can mitigate the persistent building effects of reinforcing alternative behavior. But stay tuned. We're not done yet. And there are lots of other people who I'm hoping will be attempting to replicate these studies. This is excellent. I love it. The one question I have to kind of round everything out, I believe. Is this our dissemination stop? I believe it is the the dissemination stop because it leads us into next week's discussion. Jake, how are you supposed to be the first person to talk in dissemination station when you have to do the sound effect before we get there? I know. I got excited. I've been thinking about it. (laughs) I offered I offered to record her doing that so we could just like play it in and she refuses. She no, wants to I it's live it. every time. That's a different train every <laughs> time. So something that's been on my nerves for my almost life, adult life, almost. Wow. Yeah, thanks. Is regarding that momentum? Yeah. Regarding <laughs> momentum, once I understood what it was, uh-huh. is when you Google behavior momentum, right? So I just as one did, does. As one does. I Googled it. And almost every single one of the articles or discussions based on behavior momentum comes up really making it synonymous with high P, low P sequence. I'm looking at a ton of all of these. Like, look, there's so many. Like, compliance task what? cards, PowerPoints from reputable agencies talking about behavior momentum in the context of the high P, low P sequence. What do we do as behavior analysts to dispel this notion that the behavior momentum metaphor is synonymous with the high P-low P sequence? Well, people still call non-contingent reinforcement non-contingent reinforcement. So at some level, you just live with it. Okay. But when, I'm not uh, sure I can. You can shun those people. I don't shun anyone. You can at- attempt to go and talk to them about how what they're doing is instructional fading. Mm-hmm. And part of what is really important, if you think that what you're doing is changing the momentum of the response class of problematic behavior, the non-compliance, you're not even correct in the behavioral mechanism that's likely producing change. True. If the reinforcement for high probability compliance is something that's making it more likely that the low probability compliance demands are now being complied to, you're probably abolishing the reinforcing efficacy of the non-compliance in the low probability situation. So you might be using that term behavioral momentum, but you don't know why behavior is changing because it's right. most likely an mm-hmm. abolishing operation. Right. Right. So I hope everyone is listening. <laughs> this, this is why we've done this. too, right? Yeah. You don't know why behavior is changing. That's true. Satiation or extinction are the suspects, but Likely yes. culprits. <laughs> um, Satiation being another abolishing operation. Mm-hmm. But so that's why we've chosen to do this two-parter in May, even though we have not published on the high P, low P sequence. But we thought if we were going to talk about behavior momentum, we had to dispel the notion that they are the same. Mm-hmm. So I want you to just tune in next week. They're that's not. Right. Maybe you should Google Scholar behavior momentum rather than Google it. Yeah, but the normal person is not going to Google Scholar it. Do a Google. The applied yeah. behavior analyst out there should, should be going to I Google agree with Scholar. You. They should. And I if you're a BCBA, the BACB is providing you access on the Unless resources you work in an institution. articles for free. Except if you work in an institution like us. Well, what you need to do is, is 
register and log in your home account so that you could still access it and not going through your institution. That's funny. You should just email me. I didn't say that. Oh, no. I heard <laughs> that. That, was, that was Rob. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob, you're the worst. You know me. I'm always trying to find loopholes for how to get research. I'm just that guy. I just email Rob and say, Rob, can you get I know. this article for me? I, 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 I still pay for my Java subscription, <laughs> even though I got it free. I email, I email my library. I'm like, I need these articles. I need this whole journal for my life. And they're like, we'll see what we can do. XOXO. Yeah. <laughs> so I have kind of, kind of to, not exactly to wrap up, but so for individuals, they're listening to this, they're, they're, they're realizing, you know, their, their eyes are opening to the idea of behavioral momentum is not synonymous with a high P sequence. What should we tell them to be kind of looking out for in their day to day practice in terms of examples of behavioral momentum just more concrete ones to sort of can keep wrapping their minds around the, the the metaphor at this point some good starter points well going back to the beginning behavioral momentum is an attempt to conceptualize the strength of an operant class of responding so whenever you're attempting to change behavior when you're looking at the the response class in isolation right we have molecular blinders on most of the time. We want to see what happens with that one response. Well, what happens with that one response is very well captured by that notion of behavioral momentum. So when you're putting together your interventions for problem behavior, looking at not only the behavior change that you see, but what happens when the intervention isn't in place might be something that you want to examine. This is an area that is starting to receive some attention by some really super fantastic applied researchers. Just saw a talk that, for instance, uh, one area, uh, John Rapp, has been looking at what happens not only when um, you have an intervention in place, but what happens for a period of time afterwards. When we look at behavior change in time, our goal depending on what the problem behavior is, is either elimination, like with a self-injury or with aggression, um, but with other responses, they may only be problematic in a particular context or situation, like stereotypy. So as we have our our goal of elimination, particularly for severe problem behavior, like self-injury and aggression, uh, we want to be crafting the intervention strategies we have such that it's less likely that problem behavior is going to continue to be problematic. If we look to implement a DRA in ways that's going to make it less likely that the problem behavior is going to occur again later, we should be focusing on why the lessons of behavioral momentum may be useful to bring into those situations. The real life situations, why do we do one thing versus another, generally relates to one thing's more reinforcing and regardless of the other shit that's happening in our life, (laughs) we're more likely to continue to do those things that are more reinforcing than those things that are not. Like watch bad TV, a.k.a. Hallmark. (laughs) Jackie Wink, for those of you listening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's all year round now. They're absolutely horrible. Best. (laughs) Dora the Explorer for middle-aged women. (laughs) Well, you've accurately pinned me for Dora, because I am. The They're story making... is the same beginning, middle, yeah. and end. I don't like being surprised. There's a live action Dora the back, Explorer back, movie back, coming back. out. It's like, wine and a husband, wine and a husband for those Hallmark movies. All right. Great. Well, this this has been an excellent conversation all about behavioral momentum. Thank you, Bill. Thank it you, was Bill. such Thank a pleasure you for having you back, me. Bill. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. It was fun. Yeah. I think that brings us to the end of our talk on behavioral momentum. So I want to make but sure. But we were just getting rolling. Oh, all right. That's, I'm just going to cut your mic and we're going to be. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> so I want to say a big thanks, of course, to Dr. Bill Ahern for being on the show again. It's always great to have him here to go over any of the complex topics because do you have you, you have such a good way about you bill of explaining these things you I, do. I love it it's so awesome we were lucky to have you as as an advisor and a mentor and a friend and i was lucky to have you two as students oh Thanks, we're all bill. crying now <laughs> <laughs> i'm not crying you're crying <laughs> Also, thanks, Jackie and Diana, for, of course, being on the on the show that you co-host every week. So it's, it's so good welcome. you'd be here as well. Thank you, Rob. 
We'll be back again You're next week. You're great too, Rob. Oh, thanks, God. Oh, thank <laughs> you. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to prompt anyone or anything. <laughs> and thanks to you, the listener at home, for checking out ABA Inside Track. If you like the show, why not subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And um, come see us at ABAI. Oh, that's right. We have ABAI. It's coming up. I th- yeah, that won't be won't have happened when this comes out. Nope. So you can go say hi to uh, to Jackie, to Diana. Bill, will you be will you be there? I will be there. Okay. Do you want people to come up and say hi to you? Sure, I'm also giving a tutorial on treating stereotopy. Ooh. Oh, yes, if you have the chance to go to a Bill tutorial on stereotopy, you have to go. Do it. It's always, it's always, there's always something new. Even Do if you've it. seen, you know, you've, you've looked at some of the research, you always learn something new. There will be videos. Ooh. Oh, there you go. There will be music themes. Sold. <laughs> Whoa. Diane and I are presenting a workshop on Friday that is sold out. Sold what? out. Mm-hmm. So yep. if you wanted to go, tough Sorry. luck for you, you can't. But we would love to see you anyway. Find us, hear my voice in an elevator, and say hi. <laughs> so many people to go see. Fill out your ABA uh, I bingo card, you know. Um, where? Uh, what, what other things should people remember to do? Oh, you know. Be a great behavior analyst. Be a great right. behavior analyst. That's impo- That's certainly certainly important. Uh, some some places you can, you know, connect with that would be on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, whereas ABA inside track uh these episodes come out on youtube as well where you can see them with subtitles you can check out our website at abainsidetrack.com where you can apply for ces and have links to the show and you can also feel free to give us an email at abainsidetrack at gmail.com uh, and again i almost always forget but kyle Sturry, thank you so much for our interstitial theme as well All right, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that everyone gets that second secret code word, if they are so inclined, and that code word is avalanche, A-V-A-L-A-N-C-H-E, avalanche, like that hit 70s movie about all the people at the ski resort and they got stuck in a big avalanche, Um, and by famous, I mean they made fun of it on that Mystery Science Theater 3000 reboot, but you know, it could be a rock avalanche, snow avalanche, it's something falling on you from above, avalanche. We'll be back next week with another full-length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! See you! I'm the only one left. Bye! Bye! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>